I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew as we continue our study there. And uh, just want to say again by way of um, announcement that the new edition of the Community Study Guide is something that you can use for note taking as well as uh, continued study, reflection on the text that we are looking into. So if you would like, please help yourself slip out, grab one of those editions from the table and um, come on back in with it. That's perfectly fine. Certainly encourage you in that way. And um, as we focus our attention this morning into the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Before we do, I just want to uh, share with you a prayer request for the Barlow family. Uh, Ed's father passed away, 94 years of age. Um, so we want to invite you and encourage you to pray for Ed and Sheila Barlow and Ed's family at the uh, recent uh, passing of his father just, um, just over the last uh, day, really, a couple of days. So please uh, keep the Barlow family in your prayers. Let's uh, just pause for a moment of prayer together. Uh, our gracious Father, we are mindful, Lord, that um, it's your presence that we need. It's, it's you, O oh Lord, that um, have promised never to leave us. Uh, you have granted to us, O oh Lord, the assurance of your presence. And we are lost uh, apart from, uh, from the knowledge of Jesus Christ and of the presence of our Savior with us. So, Lord, I want to thank you this morning for bringing uh, the comfort and care that the Barlow family especially needs right now. Lord, would you be gracious to, uh, to minister your peace to them in the midst of uh, the storms in which they find themselves. Uh, the, the loss of a loved one, Lord, no matter what age, is a, is a difficult and often um, traumatic experience. Lord, would you just surround them now? Would you bless them, Lord, with the assurance that, um, that they are not alone and that you will be gracious, Lord, to comfort them and to continue to keep them in your care. Thank you so much, Lord. We, we just uh, lift them to you now and praise you for uh, your ministry to them. And ask, Lord, that you'll just bless our time together as we spend these moments in your word. And uh, Lord, help us to truly hear uh, what you are saying. And thank you for speaking in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew 13, looking at a, s a selection of verses that ac actually focus our attention on the parables of Jesus. And we're not actually looking at any parables that will commence next week and in the weeks uh, and the week after that. But um, we're going to focus on some verses in Matthew 13, that, which is filled with parables. And we're going to focus on the verses that teach us about parables. So let's look together, starting at verse 1, verses 1 through the first part of verse 3, verses 10 through verse 17, and then verses 34 through 35. So you see it's kind of a, a selection, a cross-section really of this chapter. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. Now drop down to verse 10. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says... You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart 
has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And then verses 35, 34 and 35. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. When it comes to words, there's a wealth of insight that we can glean. Especially concerning what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. A philosopher once said, wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. And so it's true, isn't it? Indeed, the Bible has much to say about our speech. A couple of my favorite Sayings in the Bible, verses of Scripture that speak about our speech. One from Proverbs, and Proverbs has many such sayings. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. Poor Eric had this problem. So, Brian, go off the floor. But Tim is absolutely, absolutely not doing anything in the back. God's purposes will prevail. So I just have to stay right here, which um, uh, is not a problem much of the time. I hope it won't be this morning. Until it comes time for communion, I will figure that out later. Did you find the one, ask the one if you want to try yours? <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just want to make sure you're still tracking with me this morning. All right. So, from the Proverbs, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the body. Indeed. So true. And James 126. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. Wow. People we know often add their thoughts to the subject of speech, and I, in my mind, uh, recalled something that Cindy had shared with me over the years and from many years ago, how she remembers her maternal grandmother often saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And how true, how true that can be. Commonly heard phrase used by many people with several variants. If you have something to say, say it. Or, if you have something to say, say it to my face. Or, if you can't say it to my face, don't say it at all. Interesting, huh? Well, one popular phrase is quite telling, I believe, with, with regard to our text here in Matthew chapter 13, and, this, and it is this. Always say what you mean and mean what you say. 
Seems like Jesus could have used that advice. Always say what you mean and mean what you say. Why on earth did Jesus speak in parables? Why couldn't he make it clear? Why couldn't he take the time that was necessary to simply say it like it was and say it to the people's faces and make it as clear to them as possible? Why speak in such a confusing manner when he could have said it simply and succinctly, plainly spoken? What is the purpose of parables anyway? Well, here in the 13th chapter, we're told what the purpose of parables is. But let me take a moment just to share with you what the meaning of the word parable is. It literally means to cast aside, to cast aside, or to throw something alongside. And it has to do with this idea that that this is something, that, a teaching method that Jesus used to, to convey a point, a lesson, a meaning, where two things are contrasted, where two things are compared, in order to, to take something which is hidden and make it clear and make it understood. So in fact, in as much as parables can have a confusion about them, some, or be confusing, that there's actually clarity by the use of parables. Rather interesting. And in fact, Jesus used parables extensively. In Matthew chapter 13 alone, there are between six and eight parables, depending on, on how you read them and how you interpret them or, or understand them. And some 50 parables that Jesus actually used throughout the course of his relatively short ministry. Uh, let's look at the reason Jesus used parables more frequently in his ministry actually from this point forward. If you look back at the 13th chapter in the first verse, you will see there, as we're told by Matthew, that same day, just those words, that same day. So very important for us to recognize that scripture helps us understand scripture. That same day is a description of what was occurring in the unfolding of Matthew's telling of the gospel story, of the gospel message. That same day obviously refers back to something that had just previously taken place. And as we go back into the 12th chapter, we realize that there was strong opposition to Jesus. In fact, that the opposition was growing stronger. People were rejecting Jesus and rejecting the message that he was preaching, the words that he was teaching. It was increasing. And Jesus warned the people of the danger that they were in, the danger of rejecting him. He was warning them. He was making this more clear to them. Why is that? Because Jesus came as the Messiah and to reject his teaching was to reject him and to reject him was to reject the hope, the promise of salvation that Messiah would bring. And it was after their rejection that Jesus began to, to teach the people in parables. A New Testament scholar explains, Jesus deliberately adopted the parabolic use or method of teaching at a particular stage in his ministry for the purpose of withholding further truth about himself and the kingdom of heaven from the crowds who had proved themselves deaf to his claims and irresponsive to his demands. Some of you might relate to this in, a, in this way. As parents, you have spoken to your child or to your children and, and you've said the same thing over and over and over and over again. What they would call like a broken record. And you finally reached a point where you stop saying it. You just stop. You're not going to go down that road anymore. You're not going to repeat it one more time. You're just done with it. Why? Not because you don't love them. Not because you don't care about them. Not because you aren't concerned that they are going to get it. 
but because you know that they are unwilling to do anything with what you have been telling them, with what you've been saying to them. And I think that that might help us grasp, in fact, what it is that Jesus was doing. Jesus was a master storyteller. And Jesus used the common things around him to teach others the truths of the kingdom of God. When he was walking along the road, he, he talked about the seed. When he watched people put money into the treasury, he, he talked about the true spirit of giving by, by drawing attention to, a, to a, a woman who gave just two small coins. Insignificant, really. But yet they were all she had. Now, now those things may be difficult for us to relate to because we don't, come from that kind of a culture, that kind of uh, setting, predominantly an agrarian society. If Jesus taught in the 21st century, I'm quite convinced, if it especially was in 21st century North America or in more uh, developed parts of the world, he would speak about smartphones. <laughs> He would, he would talk to us about, about these systems that you can buy for your house where you, where you speak and the lights come on. Whether you say Alexa or Google or some of these other new ones that are coming out. He would, he would tell us about iTunes and Spotify and he would use things that are common to us to teach us what it is he was endeavoring uh, to, to teach and for us to know. And there was a reason why Jesus spoke in parables that was very practical. In fact, rooted in the opposition he faced. You see, if Jesus had continued to speak in a, in a direct manner, he would have offended, he would have continued to offend the Jewish leaders who were uh, ac actually, uh, raised, whose ire was raised against them against him. He would have continued to cause a greater rift between himself and these people when his purpose was to teach those whose hunger and thirst for the word, for the righteousness of, of God uh, was evident, his disciples. And so he spoke in parables to continue to instruct his disciples in matters of great urgency and importance. Interestingly enough, in order to comprehend the parable, you really had to stop and think about it, which someone who did not want to hear what Jesus said would have no interest, no interest in, in trying to figure it out. It's like giving a riddle. You know, you find an inquisitive child and you give that child a riddle. That inquisitive child will continue to dwell upon that riddle until they can figure it out. Someone who doesn't care anything about riddles doesn't matter to them at all. They're not, it's not going to be phased. They're just going to continue on as if it was never ever said. The disciples' hunger and thirst for righteousness and for the things of God's kingdom literally compelled them, I believe, to, to desire to dig in. And Jesus illustrates this point. We'll talk about it in just a moment. But see, the troubling aspect behind Jesus' use of parables is that they, these parables would harden the hearts of unbelievers. Why wouldn't Jesus want unbelievers to get it, to understand? Well, that's what Jesus is asked by his disciples. Why he speaks in parables. Look at verse 10. We read there in Matthew chapter 13, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? It's a simple question. And Jesus said to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, God was being merciful to those whose hearts were open, whose hearts he had opened to his word. And so God is, is making it possible for those whose hearts are, are hungry for him to understand, to grow deeper in their knowledge, to find the truth, and to seek to live by that truth. And Jesus makes this clear. But then he also says that to them, that is, to those who um, had rejected him, it has not been given. 
that he was not going to make truth clear to those who had rejected himself, Jesus, that is. And to make this point, Jesus quotes from the prophet Isaiah, where in Isaiah chapter 6, we read these words. God says, um, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You see those words right here in this text in Matthew chapter 13, that quotation from Isaiah chapter 6. It sounds like Isaiah is being sent out to, and, and to confuse the, the people. But that's not the case at all. In fact, we might conclude that Jesus was intentionally teaching in parables so that people might be kept from believing. But actually, this isn't right either. Isaiah didn't speak in riddles when he went to Israel. He spoke plainly. In fact, we see elsewhere in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 28, listen to these words. Who is he trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? To children weaned from their milk, to those just taken from the breast? For it is do and do, do and do, rule on rule, rule on rule, a little here, a little there. Isaiah was being ridiculed because he spoke plainly. In fact, his critics said he spoke so simply that even children would understand him. So he wasn't trying to be confusing, Isaiah. He was trying to make the word clear. To fulfill his God-ordained calling, Isaiah the prophet didn't gloss over his words. He spoke directly and with clarity. But here's the catch. It wasn't that the people didn't understand what Isaiah was saying. They understood, but they willingly turned away. Think about that. How often do you tune out those around you? Well, sometimes it's intentional, other times it's not. But how often do you tune out those around you? Let me raise that quite a bit. How often do you tune out God? How often do you hear but not listen to what God is speaking? I think it happens all the time, uh, especially in a general sense in life. I think for those of us who are older, over the years of our life, we've heard and we've generally ignored a number of sayings, another of a number of warnings. For example, smoking is dangerous to your health. But yet people still smoke. Drinking and driving don't mix. But people still drink and drive. A sedentary lifestyle is bad for your health. But people don't exercise. Seat belts save lives. But how many people buckle up? You see, Isaiah went to a people that had become hardened to the truth of God, and that's exactly what it was in Jesus' day. That's exactly where it is today. People have become hardened and are not hearing the voice of God. You see, in Jesus' day, people seemed interested up to a point, but then they would turn away or respond angrily against what Jesus said. Look at chapter 13 in Matthew and look at the 15th verse. For this people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed. You see the response? Jesus is not saying that the parables are making the, the people unresponsive. Jesus is saying it's their calloused, hardened hearts that bring confusion. They will, not, they will not listen. They refuse to listen. And that's why they cannot, will not be brought to faith. Some believe that Jesus spoke in parables to illumine the truth, not to hide it. But as the people rejected the truth, they became even less able to understand it. And so it is that the more they resisted, the less sensitive they were to the Spirit of God. Let me bring this point closer to home. Every person here is given the same opportunity to both hear and respond to God's voice. But many of us are not listening. Many of us are not listening. We've closed our ears to the voice of God. 
Unless, of course, he says what we want, what we want to hear. You know what that's like. It's like, it's like a child who cry, whose cries and complaints grow, grow increasingly louder, more and more pronounced, who carries on and carries on, flailing around. We've all had children who have seen children like that, haven't we? And they're begging, and they're pleading, and they're wailing, and carrying on like a child. <laughs> That's what they are, right? And then something magical, mystical happens. That parent caves. <laughs> and amidst the screams, the shrieks, the sobs, that child stops in an instant. Why? They hear what they want to hear. They hear the words they've been longing to hear. Okay, here it is. You can have it. You see, something triggers a response where everything else that's been going on gets turned off in an instant. And I think it's often, it's often that way with us. We carry on because we don't hear from God what we want to hear from God. And, and we're not going to listen to him until we get what we want. Much like a child is not going to listen to their parent until they get what they want. Think about this. The first time you do something you know is wrong. You feel the stab of your conscience warning you. The next time you do the same thing, the stab becomes a little less intense. After a few more times of warning, that, that is more a twinge of conscience, but little more. In fact, it's easily ignored, and after ignoring it long enough, you no longer feel any, any guilt whatsoever. Why? Because your heart has become hardened. Because of the deadness of your spirit. And that is when you are in the most dangerous and vulnerable place. You see, it doesn't matter how you view God. Perhaps you say God is irrelevant. Perhaps God doesn't even exist. The one thing that cannot be denied is that every person is hardwired with a conscience. Every person. The ability to know and choose between good and evil. That is in you because God placed it there. The more that Jesus spoke in parables to unbelievers, the more they resisted the, the message. The more they resisted the message, the, the more hardened their hearts became. Many believe, and I agree, that the stories of Jesus were designed to illuminate the truth. And this is what Jesus was doing. The stories he told illustrated the truth that he lived. The power of transformation resident in the word of God to so open the minds of those who purpose to know Jesus so that their knowledge of him would translate into life action. So that people who purpose to walk with Jesus would reflect his likeness more and more. Not simply being a people who give intellectual assent to the things of God, but a people who live, live life in the power of God. And there's a huge difference. So much of our teaching methods today, and for many years, have been the impartation of knowledge. And while that is not entirely wrong, it is wrong in terms of our understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus is not simply about reciting the word of God. It's about being impacted by the Word of God.
transformed by its power, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ every single day in our attitudes and in our actions, by our lives and through our words. Eugene Peterson captures this idea well. He said, Jesus continually threw odd stories down alongside ordinary lives and walked away without explanation or altar call. Then listeners started seeing connections, God connections, life connections, eternity connections. Parables aren't illustrations that make things easier, Peterson says. They make things harder. By requiring the exercise of our imagination, which, if we aren't careful, becomes the exercise of our faith. So, what is it that we can learn from these truths? What is the purpose of parables? Really, twofold. First, parables are the evidence of God's mercy. God is not trying to make a relationship with Himself more difficult, God wants a relationship with you. To those given the grace of God to know him and understand him as the disciples were, parables serve as a big reminder that only God can open the eyes of our understanding. To those who thirst after righteousness, Jesus satisfies. To those who hunger after God, Jesus meets them and opens their eyes and their minds to his word. And by God's mercy, he makes it possible to see and hear what he is saying and what he is saying to you. That's why Jesus said in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 13 that God had given the secrets of the kingdom to those who so hunger after and thirst after him. And I love what verse 12 says, which by the way is our memory verse for these next six weeks. Matthew 13 and verse 12. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Understand this contextually. We're talking about the truth of God. We're talking about the ability to comprehend the word of God. We're talking about understanding the power of God at work in our lives to change us from who we are into the person that he's calling us to be. And that is not a better me or a better you. It is Christ-likeness. Period. God wants us and helps us understand him through his word. And the whole point of parables is not to keep the knowledge of God hidden from those whose spiritual eyes are open and whose minds have been illumined by the spirit of the living God. No, it's not to keep you in the dark because he is turning on the light. He wants you to come to a fuller, deeper knowledge of himself that you might be conformed to his likeness more and more. But listen, parables are not only a, a sign uh, or, if you will, evidence of God's mercy, but parables serve as a warning. And this is so very important. See, to those who are rejecting Christ, to those refusing to see him as the Messiah, those parables have an entirely different purpose. And we'll go on to see it as we look at parables starting next week. It's possible, it's possible to hear the truth and still ignore it. People do it all the time. It's possible to be surrounded with evidence and refuse to accept it. <clears throat> the sun is shining. No, it's not. It's possible to be religious and still not be reborn. Jesus spoke in parables because those whose hearts were dull, whose hearts were closed, whose eyes were, were, were blind, would not understand correctly. Why? Because those people, like others today, are under the judgment of God. Their hearts are hardened and their spiritual senses are deadened. And only God and his mercy can change that. And this condition is perpetuated, perpetuated by the great deceiver himself, Satan. As our adversary, he wants to harden people's hearts, and he wants to keep them that way. 
He will do everything and anything in his power to get people to ignore God's truth. He will convince people that there's no hurry in responding to the gospel. Nothing could be further from the truth. Not one of us is guaranteed tomorrow, let alone the rest of today. He will point out the apparent inconsistencies of Scripture. Well, you know that this on this page is so much different than this on this page. He will do that. He will, tell every, he will tell people everything they have to give up in order to follow Christ. Well, you know what? If we were doing a better job with the gospel, we would make it clearer right from the start. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and you must follow him. Yes, you will give up everything, but you will gain everything. Why gain the world and lose our soul? when we can have Christ and have everything that Christ offers. Satan will tell, you that, uh, tell a person that they are good enough to make it to heaven just the way they are. Why? Because they're not as bad as somebody else. He will point out that times have changed and God's ways don't work. He will try and get people to substitute religious activity. And guess what? There are churches full of people who carry on lots and lots of religious activity, but whose true relationship with Jesus is at best weak. Because activity is not what it's about. In other words, he'll do anything he can to keep, you blind, keep people blind and close to a knowledge of the truth. I want to say this morning as I bring our thoughts to a close that God's purpose is to grow his people and God's purpose is to bring us to a place where we understand him more and more where our hearts hunger and thirst for him where we not only hear the words but we heed the words of God we're not just casually listening, but we're intently looking into the scriptures. One of the greatest challenges and threats to a relationship that's a vibrant relationship with the Lord is the challenge of reading God's word. It might surprise you to think that, that I don't read the word of God anywhere near where I should be. You might say... Well, you're a pastor. You're in the Word every day, and that would be true. It's hardly a, a, a day that ever goes by that I'm not in the Word for some reason or other. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about my own personal relationship. Listen, I am challenged greatly, even though I'm one who should be in the Word of God every day, for myself, for hearing what God is saying. I'm in the Word to convey to you what God wants to say, to help prepare lessons, to teach Bible studies, to do a host of other things. I'm talking about my walk with Him. If I'm challenged that way, how much more are you challenged when you're not paid to open your Bible every day? <laughs> right? The harsh reality. I mean, really, would you hire, would you hire a, do we have any, yeah, we got plumbers, sorry. I'm trying to think, we got any electricians here this morning? No electricians, right? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make electricians look really bad here all of a sudden. Would you hire an electrician that had no clue what they were doing? Some of you have been there, I realize that. <laughs> you found out too late, right? Would you hire an electrician who had no clue, never opened a book and understood the basic principles of electricity? Would you do that? That's absurd, isn't it? Would you get on a plane and the pilot comes on and smiles and you say, yeah, this is my first time on a flight and the pilot says, yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, would you get on? Now, some people say, well, that takes faith. Well, that's not faith, that's stupidity. <laughs> really, that's stupid. Why would you expect to call yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, 
how can you be a disciple without getting into the word of God? We've got to be people who understand that the only way to follow our Savior is to be a people who are in the Word of God. Listen, we're going to come to this table here. I'm going to ask those who are serving to prepare and come now. This table of the Lord, this communion table, most of us, many of us, I should say most of us, many of us understand what this is. But, but it's possible that there are some of us that don't understand what it is. And it's like, oh, it's snack time. You know, and we, we just kind of go through the motions here of this table as if somehow that, that's what this is all about. You know, we're just going to, we're going to come to this table this morning and we're going to have a, a little tiny piece of a cracker. Wish they could be bigger. You know, we kind of think these this way. And, and, a, and the tiniest cup of juice you ever had, right? And we think, wow, this is like insignificant if they wanted to give me a snack they could have given me something more this represents something what does this represent what what's the meaning of this this is something that we that we can't take lightly this is not just something that we do because we've always done it we have no business taking of this bread and this cup unless we're in right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because if we are not, we nullify its meaning. Listen, what's more, if we're not right in right relationship with others, not just the vertical plane, but the horizontal plane, if we're not in right relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we have no business taking this, this, uh, these elements. Why? Because we're eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves if we do. It's a serious matter, and sometimes we forget that. That's what an understanding of the Word of God and a growing and deepening knowledge with our, in our faith does. It helps us grasp such things. I would invite you just to pause with me and just to say, Lord, we're going to ask you to search our hearts this morning, just in a moment's time, that we are going to come and take of this bread and this cup in, in, in remembrance of Jesus. That our hearts would be made right before him. Why? Because he's promised to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sin to him. It's his blood that covers our sin. We're not perfect. You don't have to pretend to be perfect. No one's perfect here. I know some of you are close, but no one's perfect. But praise God, we don't have to be perfect. Jesus died for us as sinful people. What a powerful truth that is.